What if I told you the houses of the Vikings, the fearsome raiders of legend, weren't crude wooden huts, but living, breathing structures so ingeniously built that storms and rot had to surrender to them? From that question arises a story of ancient carpenters who turned timber, stone, and earth into flexible fortresses. The Viking longhouse at first glance appears simple. A long wooden hall stretched across the landscape like a grounded ship. But step closer, and simplicity disappears. These longhus could reach 75 meters, sheltering families, servants, craftsmen, livestock, and the daily rhythm of an entire community. They weren't cabins, they were ecosystems. Inside, life blended seamlessly. Sleeping, weaving, forging, cooking, storytelling. A longhouse was a workshop at dawn, a feasting hall by dusk, and a barn through the northern night all warmed by smoke rising softly into the rafters. Yet the true wonder wasn't how people lived inside these halls, but how the halls themselves survived. How did timber and earth endure violent storms, constant moisture, freezing winters, and salt-heavy winds without nails, cement, or modern tools? How did these frames resist rot, flex with the seasons, and stand long after their builders were gone? To understand that, we must look past the walls. A Viking longhouse wasn't merely constructed. It was engineered. The hall was crafted with such insight and adaptability engineered. that even nature had to a yield. With the Vikings understood a truth many early builders missed. Water is patient, truth. and Water it destroys, destroys from, from below. below. Moisture was the silent enemy of northern wooden homes, so they solved it with elegant simplicity. Before raising a single beam, they built a dry stacked stone foundation, flat boulders fitted by hand without mortar, held together by weight and skill. On this platform sat the wooden sole beam, lifting the entire house above the wet ground. That small elevation changed everything. With timber raised, air flowed beneath the floorboards, drying the space, preventing rot, and keeping insects at bay. What looked like a simple row of stones became an early form of passive ventilation, a natural climate control system. Stone first. Wood elevated. A house built to breathe. This foundation allowed longhouses not just to endure brutal northern winters, but to thrive in them. The stones carried the load. The air carried the moisture away. The wood, spared from decay, became a living frame capable of lasting generations. In a land shaped by storms and frost, the Vikings began their homes with a lesson modern builders often forget. Survival starts from the ground up. When most people picture ancient houses, they imagine thick, rigid walls carrying the weight. But Viking builders followed a different philosophy. Their long houses stood because of the frame, not the walls. Vertical posts, corner posts, mid posts, Inner rows formed a strong wooden skeleton. Massive horizontal beams locked into these posts, distributing weight like the ribs and spine of a living creature. This post and beam, or stave construction, became a hallmark of Scandinavian architecture for centuries. The walls, by comparison, were light and flexible. Thin planks hung between the posts like windshields rather than structural supports. In some regions, they even curved inward, echoing the graceful lines of the longships that carried Vikings across rough northern seas, a quiet reminder of their maritime heritage. This wasn't decoration. It was brilliance. With the frame carrying the load, the house could flex with the seasons. Storm winds bent the planks instead of breaking them. Humidity caused the walls to shift while the inner skeleton stayed steady. The longhouse didn't resist nature. It moved with it swaying, settling, adapting. In the harsh northern climate, that flexibility wasn't a flaw. It was survival. Step inside a Viking longhouse, and the first thing you feel isn't the walls. It's the vast, open space. Running the length of the hall, two or sometimes three rows of massive wooden posts rose like ancient trees. These posts supported crossbeams, which in turn carried the entire weight of the roof. The outer walls held almost nothing. They were the skin. The strength lived in the bones. This internal skeleton created something rare for the early medieval world. A sweeping, uninterrupted interior. Clan gatherings, 
Winter feasts, craftwork, storytelling, all unfolded in the same open hall, illuminated by firelight. In the coldest months, the longhouse served an additional purpose. Animals were sometimes kept in designated sections, their body heat blending with the warmth of the hearth. Family, livestock, work, ritual, all coexisted beneath one roof, forming a single communal rhythm. And the design wasn't just social brilliance, it was structural genius. With weights centered along the inner posts, the house could shift, settle, and endure pressure without collapsing. Storms battered the walls, snow pressed on the roof, yet inside, the hall remained steady, resilient, alive. In a harsh northern world, the Vikings didn't just build shelter. They built a cathedral of timber where openness and strength worked as one. Iron was rare in the Viking Age, expensive, difficult to make, and quick to rust in the northern climate. So Viking builders did something extraordinary. They raised entire longhouses without a single metal nail. Instead, they perfected joinery. Timbers were shaped with mortise and tenon joints, notches, and grooves pieces carved to slide together with precision, more like a crafted puzzle than brute force construction. Once aligned, the joints were locked with wooden pegs, tree nails cut from dense woods like oak or ash. And, something remarkable happened over time. As moisture moved through the beams, the pegs swelled inside their sockets. Joints tightened. The frame stiffened. The house became a single interlocking organism of wood. It is one of the great ironies of Viking engineering. Their wooden nails grew stronger with age, while iron nails in other cultures weakened and rusted. Nothing about this system was temporary. It was self-reinforcing. A longhouse built with joinery didn't merely withstand storms. It matured into its strength, becoming tougher and more resilient with each passing winter. To understand a Viking longhouse, you have to understand its walls, because they didn't behave like the rigid walls we know today. The outer planks weren't nailed tight or locked into fixed frames. They hung between the structural posts, seated with tongue and groove or loose plank techniques that let each board breathe, shift, and settle. In many ways, Viking walls were more like the flexible skin of a ship than the stiff shell of a house. And that flexibility was intentional. As temperatures rose and fell, as humidity swelled the wood, as winter storms slammed against the hall, the walls flexed instead of resisting. They expanded in summer, tightened in the cold, and bowed gently in strong gusts absorbing force the way a ship's hull rides waves. What looked like a weakness was actually strength. Rigid walls crack under pressure. Flexible walls bend, dissipating energy, and survive. So when Atlantic winds roared against the longhouse, the building responded with movement, not breakage. It swayed never dramatically, never dangerously just enough to yield instead of snap. In a world of brutal weather and constant seasonal change, this quiet adaptability was genius. The Vikings didn't build homes that fought the elements. They built homes that moved with them. And that is why their halls endured where others failed. When the Vikings settled the new lands, especially the treeless stretches of early Iceland, Iceland's they faced a simple problem. There wasn't the enough wood. But instead of abandoning their architectural principles, they adapted with striking creativity. They kept the wooden frame of the longhouse, but replaced the outer walls with turf, thick sod bricks, cut from the earth, and stacked like masonry over stone foundations. These weren't makeshift solutions. They were natural insulation, dense, moisture-resistant, and incredibly durable. In winter, turf trapped warmth like an earthen shelter. In storms, its weight anchored the house. In wet climates, it breathed with the moisture instead of rotting beneath it. Many settlers even carried the idea upward, adding turf roofs living layers of soil and grass that blended the home into the landscape. From afar, these longhouses looked almost grown from the ground itself. The benefits were profound. Warmer rooms, better food storage, protection from relentless coastal winds, and rain. The longhouse became a refuge, a pocket of human warmth carved out of an unforgiving climate. In places where trees were scarce, the Vikings didn't weaken their architecture. They evolved it, proving that survival belonged to those who listened to the land and built with what it offered. 
If the walls of a Viking longhouse showed clever engineering, the roof revealed something even more extraordinary. A deep intuition for natural materials. To keep out relentless northern rain and snow, builders began with birch bark, laid over wooden decking. Birch bark isn't just water resistant, it's naturally waterproof, rich with oils that repel moisture year after year. Layered like shingles, it formed a protective skin that shed water the way a ship's hull sheds waves. But the Vikings went further. They added turf or sod on top, thick, heavy layers of living earth. The turf insulated the hull, trapping warmth through long winters and moderating temperatures throughout the seasons. Its sheer weight also anchored the roof, holding it steady against brutal Scandinavian winds. No nails. No metal. Just bark, earth, and timber, arranged with an efficiency that rivals modern roofing. The result was a roof that breathed and protected. Heat stayed in. Rain slid off. Snow melted without seeping through. Even gale force storms struggled to shake it. In a world ruled by wind and winter, the Vikings didn't force their homes to fight nature. They partnered with it, turning earth and bark into a shield stronger than iron. At the literal and emotional center of every Viking longhouse burned the hearth, a long fire pit glowing down the middle of the hall. Here meals were cooked, tools repaired, stories traded, and the pulse of daily life carried on from dawn to midnight. Benches lined both walls, shifting with the day. By daylight, they were seats for work and conversation. By night, they became beds wrapped in furs, warming children, elders, travelers, and warriors alike. The smoke drifting into the rafters might seem inconvenient to modern eyes, but to the Vikings, it was part of the design. The heat kept the hall warm through brutal winters, and the smoke preserved the beams above, deterring insects and slowing decay. In this dim, smoky light, the longhouse became more than shelter, it became a world. The wind and the Feasts fire, stretched across wooden tables. Of our Songs echoed, echoed through the roof posts. Arguments, walls. alliances, and family decisions all unfolded in the same shared glow. Animals resting in nearby sections added warmth and rhythm to the nights. A Viking longhouse wasn't merely built. It lived a communal organism where every ember and every heartbeat belonged to the group beneath one roof. Building a Viking longhouse was never the task of one carpenter or one family. It was a collective effort, a project stitched together by labor, skill, and shared purpose. Trees had to be felled, hauled, split, and shaped into beams. Stones were gathered and fitted into foundations. Turf was cut into heavy sod blocks. No single household could manage all of this while farming, fishing, and preparing for winter. So they built together. Extended families, Neighbors, and entire clans arrived with axes, ropes, and weathered hands. Children gathered branches. Women prepared food, twisted fibers, or helped with joinery. Men lifted beams, drove pegs, and set the frame piece by piece. Slowly, the longhouse rose a monument not just to engineering, but to cooperation. And in that shared effort, something deeper formed. Every post carried the touch of many hands. Every stone held the strength of the group. When storms later battered the hall, it endured not only because it was well built, but because it had been built together. To walk into a completed longhouse was to feel that unity. You weren't stepping into wood and earth. You were entering a shared identity, a, to their a living memory of a people who survived because they belonged to the one another. Community. Modern architecture often celebrates rigidity, straight lines, tight joints, walls that refuse to move. We equate strength with resistance. But the Vikings understood something builders often forget. Sometimes a structure survives not by standing firm, but by yielding. The longhouse was a masterclass in controlled flexibility. Its raised stone foundation let air move freely and moisture escape. Its stave-frame skeleton carried weight through posts and beams rather than brittle walls. The outer planks, hung loosely between those posts, flexed with heat, cold, humidity, and wind, behaving the way living wood naturally wants to move. The turf insulation and heavy earth roof added weight, stability, and breathability, allowing the house to settle with the seasons. Each component board, beam, stone, sod, worked together like a living system. 
In storms, the longhouse swayed instead of snapping. Under snow, the roof compressed and warmed rather than collapsing. Where rigid structures cracked, the Viking longhouse absorbed pressure and endured. This wasn't decorative flair. It was survival engineering born from centuries of reading landscapes, weather, and the uncompromising north. The Vikings didn't build homes that fought the elements. They built homes that harmonized with them, and that is why their halls stood where stiffer structures would have shattered. The Viking longhouse is more than a relic. It's a reminder of how humans once built with insight, humility, and harmony with the land. Viking builders understood their material stone for lifting wood above moisture, turf for insulation, bark for waterproofing, timber for strength. None of it was decorative. Every element was chosen for function, longevity, and balance with a harsh northern climate. In its simplicity, the longhouse was profoundly sustainable. It breathed with the seasons, aged naturally, and required no steel, no chemicals, no machinery, only knowledge, melts, time, and, rises, and the hands the of a community working trees, together. As our world now faces unstable steam, climates and searches for eco-friendly housing, the longhouse feels less like ancient history and more like a guide. We don't always need to fight nature with concrete and rigidity. Often the wiser path is to build with it embracing flexibility, natural insulation, passive ventilation, and materials that return to the earth. Perhaps this is the Vikings' quietest legacy. Not their raids. Not their battles. But their ability to take wood, rock, turf, and bark. And shape them into homes that lived homes that adapted, endured, and served generations. Sustainability, it turns out, isn't new. It's remembering. So, next time you think of Vikings picturing raiders marauding with axes and shields paws, Imagine instead the craftsmen, the carpenters, the builders who raised massive, storm-proof, frost-defying halls by hand. What other lost technologies or forgotten wisdom might we rediscover if we only dare to ask the right questions? If you're curious to unravel more of those hidden secrets of ancient civilizations, the ways they harnessed nature, survived harsh climates, and built societies around shared fire and timber subscribe to prehistoric shadows. Stay with us, as we journey not just through bones and stones, but through the heartbeats of humanity's past. Until next time, may your curiosity always outlast the storms.